Never Shut Up. I'm Marcellus Wiley, your host. And I'm glad you guys are joining me once again. And y'all should be thankful I'm here because I survived the holiday. Yes, much respect, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. But for a parent of four, oh, it was hell to pay in this house. That means no school for these kids. These kids were tearing the walls up and down. They went ham in here yesterday. But they don't understand the magnitude of this moment. But I certainly do. But I don't understand the magnitude of this moment as much as my father and those before me. I'm talking about MLK's dream. And let's discuss MLK's dream as inspirational as it was. Obviously, at the time when he said it, it was a different climate politically and socially and in everyone's everyday life with discrimination running rampant. Martin Luther King went up there, number 16 of 18 speakers that day. You imagine the fatigue of that crowd. And he went up there and not only inspired those in attendance, but generations to come. That inspiration has obviously led to much fruit from that conversation, that speech. And I'm one of those who has bared that fruit, who has now lived a life and an experience that's been blessed by those words that he professed that very day. But I'm not the only one because my life didn't just change. My forecast didn't just change. It changed the forecast of this entire country and the direction of this country, making moments like this possible right now in front of you on this camera. And right now I wanna introduce someone on camera, the founder of Brinks TV, my partner, John Brinkis and John, First of all, good to see you, brother. Um, Good to see me, I'm going to say, because I survived it yesterday. But just in short, what did you do to celebrate the holiday yesterday? And we're going to talk about King's legacy. Yeah, well, my mother's birthday uh, lines up with Martin Luther King's birthday. So I actually went home to Virginia to celebrate my mother's birthday, her 81st birthday, um, you know, she's oh, wow. just an incredible, incredible woman, not just because she's my mom. Uh, so we spent the uh, <laughs> holiday weekend uh, with sure. Nana and, you know, a lot of tears of joy. And it was amazing. Yeah, that's great. 81 years young, I want to say. That's amazing, man. I lost my mother when she was 49 years old. So it's a true blessing to still have that experience and that connection. And, and you know, it's interesting. I wanted to do this show, obviously, celebrating and talking about the legacy of Martin Luther King. Uh, Let's start with the the Captain Obvious of this moment, the elephant in the room. Look at this split screen right here. Like, without Martin Luther King Jr. in that moment trying to accelerate this opportunity, this integration, uh, would this come to pass? Would this be a reality? So I love it from that perspective. And then selfishly, I love it from my perspective Listening to my father over the years who grew up in Texas, down south, Tyler, Texas, in the 40s, talk about his life, talk about the differences of today, 2023, versus his life, 1940s in Texas, had to walk on a certain side of the street, had to go to a certain water fountain, certainly was fearful for his life, and it wasn't just from police. It was just from everyday citizens who he didn't know their motives that was being explained simply based off of color. And that's just unreal for me to fathom. You know, a lot of times you talk about racism today and you have to define it differently because it doesn't line up perfectly with the racism of yesterday. So, John, in your experiences, obviously Martin Luther King has touched us all. What would you say his inspiration has been to you and the life-changing experiences you've had from his legacy? You know, it's incredible that Martin Luther King is remembered for a lot of things, but to me, he should be remembered most for being courageous because people cannot really remember Mm. what life was like back then. I mean, he died in 1968. The Civil Rights Movement was passed in 1964. JFK was assassinated in 1963. The country was upside down, and you had a voice of reason where not everybody was rooting for MLK to succeed. 
and it takes a lot of courage to stand up, to speak the truth in a time when it's not convenient. And that really, for me, is what MLK defines as courage. Mm, I'm glad you highlighted that, the courage, because it seems like the courage that it took for him to go there to Washington and speak not only about civil rights, economic rights, but trying to end racism is a courage that now feels similar to what's necessary now in 2023 to discuss race relations and discuss them in reality, in their fullness and with complete honesty. Not the same exactly, but there's still some resistance in this conversation that you and I are going to unpack on this show. But coming up, we're going to continue with MLK's legacy and impact, but we're also going to dive into that wild, wild car weekend. Yes, it's time to talk NFL playoffs, and we're going to do it all next on Never Shut Up on Brinks TV and Reach TV. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Never Shut Up, Marcel Swally. John Brink is in the building, and we're about to tackle those NFL playoffs, that wild card weekend. We saw it all. We saw some blowouts. We saw some surprises. We saw some closely contested games. We saw plays and games that went down to the final second. So let me throw it at you, John. What was your biggest takeaway from this weekend? that I think I could get a job as a kicker in the NFL because I could miss four straight <laughs> extra points. That's what I All learned. Right. Oh, unreal. Like, uh, you know what? To be on the team, and you're loosely hanging on the team already by a thread in terms of respect when you're a kicker. Like, I had love for the kickers, but I was the minority, and I'm not talking about my race. I'm talking about the fact that I was the only one like, yo, we're going to need the kicker. And it was so crazy <laughs> last night watching that kicker miss a miss a miss a oh miss. God. You know Jerry Jones is like, bro, take that damn star off your helmet. You ain't no damn star. <laughs> Are you kidding me? On, Dude, all I have to tell you is watching the extra points, I felt like a chameleon. My eyes were going like this. Like, whoa, where did that ball go? <laughs> and, and everybody at home, if you ever thought that prayer doesn't work. You you saw mm. last night that prayer <laughs> does work because everybody was like, I bet I really, really, really don't want to see him miss it, but I kind of do because it just doesn't seem possible to miss four in a row. It doesn't seem possible, and it happened. Yeah, man. I don't root any ill on any man, but in this situation, <laughs> the only silver lining I felt was that poor Ohio State kicker had to be sitting there finally like this. He ordered him a large pizza, a 24-piece wing set, called his girl, and she finally picked up again. And he's like, I ain't the worst kicker out here. Oh, man, it was crazy to watch that. And, and as defeated as that was of a moment for you as a player, missing four extra points, it wasn't the biggest heartache, heartbreak this week. No. Can we just get oh. it out the way? Can we just get it out the way? Get it out of the way. Who watched the end of the Jaguars game? Because I tuned out. Like I, It was the end of the first quarter. I was celebrating my mother's 81st birthday. We all went to Happy bed. Birthday, we were like, out. <laughs> that was it. Unreal. Now, first of all, let me uh, walk over here a little bit. Because, uh, where's you know, Big Daddy going? I, 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 I might have to let you guys know that I, not only do I represent, but it's reality. I am a charger. But damn it, what are y'all doing, man? What was that? 27 donut. You're not supposed to let them eat that much. They can have a snack. 
They can come back and have a little meal, but not the whole buffet. They came back on this job and took it from us. Are you kidding me? I have never in my life ever seen anything like that. Why? Because when you have a lead like that, you can jog, they can run as fast as they can, and they won't catch you. But somehow, some way, the Chargers allowed this to happen. John, please help me. Give me some sports science. Give me something to let me know so I can hang my jersey back up. What happened? I'm going to tell you what, man. That Charger jersey and what it represents changed like that. I mean, now you hold it up and you're like biggest meltdown ever. And I'm going to give you some sports science as to how this happened. Yes, I need Because you want to know what Trevor Lawrence is? He's the new honey badger. He don't care. It doesn't matter. He throws four picks. Bang, 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 bang. He completes more passes to the other team than to his team. And you want to know what? He doesn't care. They stick with him and they're like, you know what? Maybe he can set a record for most interceptions. This is going to be amazing. And as it turns out, he's got unbelievable short memory term, uh, short term <laughs> memory loss. He just can't remember anything like me. So Trevor Lawrence st- literally looks over the field and he says, what do I have to lose? And they slay it. And as much as I want to say the Chargers blew it, I really want to say the Jaguars beat them because they really, honestly, yeah. I, if and I did this as a sports science piece, does momentum mm. actually exist? exist? We know, uh-huh. we know in our hearts that it does, but you can't prove it. But when you watch a game like that, it's undeniable. Momentum crushed the Chargers. The Jaguars won. The Chargers didn't lose. Oh, man, I could prove momentum exists just through my experiences. As you said, we saw it happen. Like, the problem is when you're up so big and so early, you can't lie to yourself. Part of you is like, yo, we got this. But in football, unless you stay primal, I'm talking about balls to the wall, pedal to the metal. Like, and you don't keep mashing every single play. Oh, something's going to come back to haunt you. And that's what happened. The Jaguars basically said, we took your best punch. We're still in this game. Why? Not because of how we're playing. Not because of the score. Because we got three quarters left. And I used to always tell my teammates, dog, if we did it like this in the first half, they could do it like this in the second half. So we got to stay on them, stay in attack mode. And I think when you become a team with a lead like that, You go into prevent defense, you go into prevent offense, you go into prevent mentality, and it prevents you from winning those games because you're no longer looking at it like, okay, I'm attacking. Now you're being passive, just hoping that time expires. Yeah. You want to know what's interesting is that people don't understand that in statistics, it doesn't matter what happened before the next event. It doesn't matter if I threw mm. four picks, five picks, six picks. Mm. The next play, I could throw a touchdown. It doesn't matter. But it takes a special person like Trevor Lawrence to just put it out of your mind. Oh, my God, I'm the guy that just threw four picks. Because if you looked at the other game with kicking, missing four extra points, you know when he missed that fourth one, it was because he was saying, I just missed three. Uh, please don't let me miss four. And he misses four. It's just like when you line up. When I line up to tee off and I say, don't hit it in the water, don't hit it in the water, you're going to hit it in the water. Oh, man, say it. Yeah, you put your mind on it. You put your whole focus on it. It's nothing but reality then. It's going to be inevitable. You're going to make that happen. You know what's crazy? When you're up 27-0, I'm looking at my son. He's like, oh, my God, they're horrible. They're done. The Chargers are killing them, Daddy. And I reminded him that, especially in football, because your scores are two points, three points, six points, you forget that 27-0 is only four plays. Like, of all of that, like, you're like, oh, my God, they're done. It's wrapped. I'm like, they're four plays away from not only tying this game, but like they did eventually winning this game. 
I've still got heartache. I got a lot of other jerseys up there. I got other teams still involved. My Cowboys still rolling. My Jaguars still rolling. My Bills are still rolling. So coming up, we're going to keep this train rolling on Never Shut Up. John will join me as well as we're going to talk about the NFL globally and why the NFL is king. That's next on Brinks TV and Reach TV. Welcome back to Never Shut Up, Brinks TV, Reach TV, Marcel Swally, John Brinkus. And we, right now, we got to give out our flowers. We need to celebrate the greatest game in our country. And that may not be because of your interests. It's just by the numbers. It's just by all of our collective interests. It's the NFL and why they're still king. Think about the NFL in terms of it being a football game at the highest level competing against other sports basketball at the highest level when in the 80s they ran it in the 90s it felt like they certainly were winning but football all of a sudden became king in a world where everything is getting spliced up our attention is being grabbed from all sorts of places and directions but we all find a way back to our living rooms to our tv sets to our sports bars at the greatest volume for the NFL. Really, to me, the greatest community we have in our country right now, where all shapes and sizes and ages come together to watch ball. John, tell me why the NFL is king in your words. It's king because it's the best game. I mean, you just, period, it's gladiators. It's incredible athletes of all shapes and sizes. You have little dudes, you have great big dudes, and you're trying to get a ball across the line and you're smashing into each other along the way. I mean, what's there not to love? So, and what's interesting is that I grew up in DC and I grew up a Redskins fan. We had three Super Bowls. We had Mark Rippon, Doug Williams, Joe Theismann, three different quarterbacks. Joe Gibbs was just king of DC. In fact, John Riggins anointed himself as king, speaking to uh, President Reagan. I mean, it was ingrained in you as a kid, as a Redskins fan, to be like, look, this is the greatest game ever. And then it proliferates out from there. And it seems like NFL free agency, while someone like Joe Gibbs really didn't want it to happen, it was the best thing to happen to the game because it spread the wealth. It was harder to create just this block Bill Belichick aside, you've had so many different teams had their runs that the whole nation rallies around great football. And we are seeing great football. Yes, it's different from smash mouth football of the 80s, but it's an awesome game. That's why it's king. Yeah, I got, I got to take a little dispute with what you said Go there ahead. because I was listening to the details. Um, the NFL is the greatest game in our country. Obviously, globally, people would say soccer. By the numbers, you have to say soccer. But in America, the greatest game is football. But the best game, I don't think, is football. I think that basketball is a better game because, one, just check your human behavior. How many times have you ever called me up or your boys up? Hey, dog, what you up to? Nothing, man. Just chilling. What's up? He's like, oh, man, let's get a little run. And he's like, what? What do you mean? Basketball? Or where are we going? What gym? You're like, no. We're going down to the high school. We're going to play some football. Like, other than a turkey bowl, which nobody really wants to play in anyway, but they're just so damn hungry they got to distract themselves. Like, who is trying to sign up and raise their hand to play football? Like, no one. Meanwhile, basketball sits there as a sport that we all want to play. Even if you can't play basketball, you play horse. You play pig. Everywhere you go, you want to participate in basketball. I think there's something with the business of football, the marketing of football, and like you said, maybe some of the gladiator aspects. But football, greatest game, but not the best game, John. Oh, stop. Listen to me. 
Yeah, let really? me define best. We're defining it by TV experience, all right? Because the live mm. experience, the best is hockey. And they're in, that's not a cliched answer. It just is. Because you can't see the watch, puck. It, listen, you're just like watching it live, and it's like watching this organized chaos What's and somehow it comes together, and it's amazing. But for television, football, this is why we like to watch it. There is mystery in the broadcast of football. All the receivers run off the screen. They're over here. And you're like, what's going to happen? And then all of a sudden, you cut back. And boom, I caught the ball. Then you're saying, what happened? I got to show a replay. So then you sit there and you go, I got to see it. That's why football rates so high is because of the mystery. Mm. I like the mystery element. That is great because you know what? The beats of football, it's almost like theater. It's a play. Like, imagine you come out, you hear your coach, or you look to the sideline, give me instruction, what's the script? And then they give you that play. We're all congregated in huddle, and then we're going to go out there and physical display to show our talents against opposition, the forces of resistance, and we're trying to move men against their will by using our skill. All of that is great, and then we reconvene and do it again. I love the beats of it, but here's the problem. If you've ever played football, you know that there are better ways to play a sport than playing football. Like, these fingers don't look like this, John, just because it was all sweet and, <laughs> sweet and sugar out there, baby. Like, I, I wonder how, how, how at home... Look at you guys. Want to get on the roller coaster? Let's ride. <laughs> what is that? Like, oh, my God. Oh, wait. Oh, hold yes, on. You got a point. This is the price the gladiators must pay for you to sit back there and have a six pack and some dominoes. This is the price we pay. But in all seriousness, man, football does a masterful job of putting out a product. And you're right. I have a season tickets, six, eight season tickets to Chargers games. And I love going, but I'm not going to lie. When they're on the road, I'm just as happy because the TV experience is so amazing. They're doing an amazing job marketing the business of football, and giving you a product that's digestible in your home. Well, that's going to be it for us on Never Shut Up on Reese TV, but you know how we do it. It's time to go over to Brinks TV. Log on to Brinks.tv right now. Get your account. Follow the show, Never Shut Up, and it's time to go into the deep end of that pool as John and I will discuss more NFL playoffs and more importantly, MLK and his legacy and impact on us all. That's next on Never Shut Up on Brinks TV. Welcome back. Never shut up. Marcellus Wiley here on Brinks TV. Really excited to get into this conversation and go deeper with it, layer this conversation. And the conversation is going to be centered around reality versus MLK's dream. And I really want to talk about the state of race relations in today's society and really contrast that to where Martin Luther King was in his life and experiences back in 1964. So let's respect where we are right now, because obviously we've progressed. Like the progress that we have taken, I think sometimes doesn't really get the full respect it deserves because we look at it as it's not perfect. As we know, perfect is the enemy of good. But damn, are we good? Whoa, have we progressed from the days and conversations that I've heard of yesteryear. Whether you're going through a history book and you look at those images and you're like, looks pretty distant to me, 
or the conversations I have with my family, my father in particular, who grew up in Tyler, Texas in the 1940s. And hearing how he had to walk on one side of the street, how he had to go to a certain water fountain, how he couldn't go to certain restaurants and places and establishments, how he moved to California because he wanted greener pastures. He wanted a safer environment because where he was, he was being judged completely, entirely just based on his skin color. But if you look at what Martin Luther King was aspiring to do and inspiring us to do versus right now, present day, you just know how far we've come. But there is still some distance that we must travel. And in that conversation, I'm going to bring in John Brinkis to discuss not only race relations today, but where we started and where we thinking this can go. John, what are your discussion points on race relations today? It's hard to articulate how far we actually have come because the rhetoric now is so acerbic about mm. things that are not really all that relevant. And what I mean by that is when people say, oh my God, uh, life's not fair. Like, hold on a second. I mean, true, life's not fair. It's not fair <laughs> for everybody. That's just the way it works. Guess what? I got a news flash. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer everywhere. We're not special in the United States. That's true. So when, and when you start having conversation, you start saying, man, that uh, thing didn't occur because of blank. I need you to bring like proof proof. Now, when your dad was growing up in the 40s, he didn't need to work all that hard to bring proof to the table. He was like, look at me. Like, trust me, life is not fair. And he was right. But now when you, we've entered into a world where everyone, it's, it goes way beyond race. People are trying to pick out the reason why something didn't work out, why they didn't get ahead, why they didn't get an A, why they're not rich. And they're assigning reasons that you're like, I, I can't follow. And I'm not sure you can bring the math and the science to the table to prove your point. So it's very hard to, for us to discuss specifically race because it's getting conflated with so many different things. Yeah, that's an amazing point right there. The, the conflation that's going on right now is so hard at times, I'm sure, when you meet adversity and you're trying to figure out what that adversity is to fully define it and to fully explain it. I give it to you like this. Let's start somewhere with a softball or you're on a football team, right? And you know you're a good football player, right? Big, fast, strong, you know the game. Coach likes you, it seems that way. But then things don't go your way, whether you're not making plays out there and all of a sudden coach is looking at you differently and you lose some of your playing time. And these are real life examples I've been through before where all of a sudden, instead of that same player realizing everybody can't play, Everyone doesn't get the same amount of time. Everyone doesn't get the ball. Instead of that player realizing that's the reality and I need to work on myself more so to become a greater player so I can get more time, they start to blame. First, it's the system usually, right? You want to say, hey, man, these plays suck. And then if that works, you go even further. Oh, man, coach is tripping. And what you're really doing is projecting because you're really feeling fractured in terms of your ego and your opportunity. You don't know which way is up and you can't pinpoint why you're down. I think that really encapsulates a lot of what's going on in race right now. Whereas you look at a situation that you're facing with adversity and if you call it racism, okay, we're listening. But if you want to say the racism of what Martin Luther King was talking about, Oh, it's going to be a tough task to show that in present day. That doesn't mean you let off the gas. That doesn't mean you don't continue to aspire to close the gap between where we are and this utopia we envision. But in reality, a lot of it was inspiring and aspirational in MLK's I Have a Dream speech. But also, some of those things like ending racism, I'm here to tell you is impossible. Ending racism is impossible because hate, evil exists. And if you're going to be tribal with your evil, tribal with your hate, then you're going to not only protect yours, 
but distance yourself from others and make them seem inferior. So this is not a new issue. We are in a greater place than I think we've ever been in our society and continue to grow. But when it gets conflated, like you said, when it becomes yesterday's racism with today's terms, that's when all of a sudden things don't seem as smart as they should be. Yeah, and I think about when we talk about racism. I mean, in today's culture, quite honestly, it's hard to categorize this country as black and white because now it's so multifaceted. I mean, interracial marriage wasn't a thing just a hundred years ago, really, right? Like it came along, it's a modern day thing. And now you have people of all kinds of shades and it's hard to say, oh, it's black versus white. It's just so many different things. And another thing about just saying racism, uh, it, what's interesting is if you uh, want to point to a country like Ireland and you say, well, Catholics and Protestants don't get along. And you want to know what? When you, when you say to the Protestant faction and Catholic faction, why don't you like each other? Like, oh, because they're different than I am. Even though they look identical, it doesn't matter. For some reason, we find a reason to hate each other, even if we look the same. And I heard a great quote from a comedian who said, racism is the most ridiculous thing ever because there are so many legitimate reasons to hate people on an individual basis. I'm like, that, that about says it all in terms of what goes through the mind in the human race. Yeah, that's tremendous because, I mean, who doesn't raise their hand and say, judge me by who I am, not what I look like. Like, by skin color distinctly, we're going to judge you. And that's what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to convey in his I Have a Dream speech. He's like, look, I understand I look different than you. But guess what? To me, you look different than me. But we're going to find our commonalities, our similarities. Let's go on that journey. Let's make sure that we're trying to respect those similarities. Not throw the baby out with the bathwater and just say, hey, you look different than me. I don't care about you. You're inferior to me. It, it really disturbs me because right now you're in a place where the hurdles in front of you a lot of times are imagined. You know, especially for me, my people, a lot of times we want to use what we have heard, what we have heard from before as today's issues of adversity. It's a different game today. Today, you look at microaggressions and you look at overt racism. They're completely different. But yeah, are there racist people out there? Of course. Are they in your way? Not so certain. Not so sure about that. And that's what we have to start to do. Individualize these conversations as we individualize each other instead of this group think and this group thought that all are something. None of us should speak for all of us, right? And in this conversation, when you're talking about race, a lot of times things get lost because some leader, some spokesman, some person will sit there and try to give you the state of race relations like that's law. But it's really an individual conversation and account. And that's why I love doing this show with you, John, is because we are going to discuss these from different positions, from different places, and from different stances. But we're trying to find that common ground. So we all know that we can go from this moment to a future moment that's even better. And that's where I wanna lead the conversations right now. Race relations in the future, how do you envision race? I think we all need to, we need to do two things. We need to reset the discussion. Because when we say racism, what are we even talking about? You and I know what we mean by it, right? Somebody universally, always, without exception, hates somebody else because of the way they look. That, to me, is a pretty <laughs> yeah. good definition of racism. But the, uh, the, what I mean by the argument gets conflated with so many other things, and, I'll, and I'm going to bring in a real example. Racism is real. What I just articulated exists, and we're never going to get rid of it, but at least we have 
a common understanding of what we're even talking about. If you bring into the conversation a topic like rape, we know what rape is, a rape. A, a woman is subject, generally, it's a woman subjected to sex against her will. What's terrible about the way that rhetoric has, has rolled out now is that rape is a real thing. So don't cry wolf when it's not actually rape because there's a real problem to solve. Don't confuse the issue. Don't say it's something it is not. And racism is the same thing. If we are trying to eliminate people from discriminating against others universally based on the way they look, then we can have a conversation. But don't cry racism when it isn't. Don't say, don't cry something and cry wolf when there's a different reason. Otherwise, we can't make forward progress and there is not a specific problem to solve. Yeah, the description, very difficult to not only feel, articulate, and convey to all, to the masses that you went through that experience. I think that, whoo, this is interesting because I've never dealt with racism. Now, when you say that, you would think I would be saying that to a round of applause. Good job, Martin Luther King, and I have a dream speech. But every time I say it, typically I get responses that are adversarial or they start to dig deeper. You sure? You positive? What about this? And it's like, but are you cheering for racism or are you cheering for a person like me, a big black man who says, I have never experienced it and I'm not alone. Like to your point about the rhetoric, to your point about the distance between the words and the reality, it just seems like there's this underlying belief system or underlying support for racism to exist, whether it's the people who make money off of the issue, not the solving, not the cure, but the issue itself, as they say, right? You look at it from that perspective and you're like, we're much better than we've ever been. And instead of just counting those wins, we continue to talk about the missteps and losses. And I look at it like in the future, I just hope that we're able to properly define what racism is versus, hey, that was just adversary to a black man or adversary to a Latino man or adversary to a white man because now we got into reverse racism. Like, we don't went so far being racist. <laughs> we got reverse racism now. You don't know which way is up. So in the future, I see it being much better if we clean up that rhetoric. I And, you know, I like to articulate, let's just go back not too long ago when it was all white men sitting in the office, right? Women weren't in the workforce. Nobody of color was in the workforce, no minorities. It was just nothing but white men. Do we think those white men were all like, well, Bill, I know you want the promotion that I want. Maybe you should have it because I'm a nice guy. Or were they like, hey, Bill, you want the promotion I want, right? Oh, well, turn around so I can stab you in the back. Like, that's what happened that in that now you mix everybody up and when someone gets stabbed in the back they go oh it's because of x it's like no 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 it's because that's the way life works people are trying to stab each other in the back all the time people are trying to keep you down people are trying to claw up on their own and climb on your back that's just the way human nature is and the last point that i want to make marcellus is listen Whatever it is that you feel, whether it's race, religion, sexual orientation, whatever, trust me, around my dinner table, and I'm very blessed because I had parents that, that raised me with love everybody. Even like so far when I was in, this is a true, absolutely true, and I still have this, my self-portrait was drawn with a black, not brown, not tan, not yellow, black crayon, black on the refrigerator, hung it up. Why? Because Francis Holmes, who was my bestie down the street, was the coolest looking kid on the block, and that's what I wanted to look like. 
My parents never mm. said, uh, you can't look like Francis. They were like, let's put it on the refrigerator. That's great. It starts mm. in the home. And my parents, I'm blessed to have incredible parents. Not everybody has incredible parents. So we need to be teaching people, look, love everybody. Give that message to your kids and then let them grow up. Let them figure it all out. I'm sure they're going to have conflict, but teach them from the get-go to love everybody. And we're still, as a human race, going to mess it up. But at least we'll give people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, man. It's crazy because that same story of purity, a little kid. Like, I've seen it. My kids as well. Uh, my kids want to be superheroes. Then they want to be their friend at school. And then they want to be like us. And they want to be all kind of things. And they don't have any malintention but just wanting to discover and do other things right but your same story if it gets out the wrong way or in the wrong hands oh that's blackface and it's like that's the problem like we can't even take the purity of something and run with that because we're always suspicious of what it could be and your greater point i really love like people study u.s history and then they come up with their arguments for racism but if you really want to get to the bottom of this, study global history, world history, forever of time. And then you will realize, oh, we some primal beings with conscious thought. Oh, man, you got to go way back. You talking about cutthroat. Like, it, it, it wasn't interracial issues. It was intra-racial issues. We look exactly the same. But there's only one boar left. And I'm sorry, my family must eat. And it started there. And guess what? That's what this whole foundation, this whole concept of life is built upon, right? And we all know that we carry and share similar spirits, a lot of similarities, but they're going to be dressed up differently. But we know what we have as a ticker. And I wish we would get back to that place where we will understand that we're better in these joined forces than us being disjointed. And it's just crazy because being in the position I'm in right now, when I talk about race, all of a sudden, oh, that's because you're rich. Oh, that's because you play ball. Oh, because they kiss your butt because you're a celebrity. I'm like, dog, I grew up in the hood and I still didn't deal with racism. But, oh, that's because you're around all your people because y'all were broke. They already won. And it's like, there's no winning this conversation only through demonstration, only through illustration of your higher being will this ever seem to the masses as a problem that's behind us instead of one that's in front of us. But let's transition right now, John, and let's talk about some dire consequences. The do or die pressure moments that the NFL playoffs always exemplify. And I'm coming to you, Mr. Sports Science, don't never shut up, because I want you to explain because I've been there before, intensity and how all of a sudden it picks up even in the playoffs. Like you think you're going 100%. You think you're running as fast as you can. You think you are performing at peak potential. And then they change the circumstances. They change the dynamics. It's not a regular season game anymore. This is a playoff game, do or die for the championship. And I swear, I don't even believe in 110%, but you go from 100 to 110%. Please give me an explanation of what that is, how that intensity goes even higher. The difference between good and great in athletes is staying calm under pressure. And the way that you go from 100 to 110% is by not having your adrenaline pump in and being all crazy eyed and being ah! It's by being an assassin, a ninja. You're just calm and you're saying, there is my target, splash! I smashed it, <laughs> I move on. Oh, the next one, splash! That's how you do it. And what explains the playoffs, uh, listen, Marcellus, there are only, there's only one of us here who have been uh, in the big leagues and that's you. And you know, Week four of the NFL, quarter three, play number five is different than NFC conference finals. It's fourth quarter. You're down by three. It's different. 
because the time is different, the score is different, the stakes are different. When people say he never takes the playoff, yes, he, God, come on, dude. <laughs> went, like, of course you take Bullshit. plays off. <laughs> I mean, stop it. In the, yeah, yeah. the playoffs, though, you may not take a playoff, because you're being a ninja and you know I got to smash every single time because I know what I need to do. Now, so are you saying the consequences become the fuel? Like, because you know that this is it. Like, this can be it. Like, I don't want to be the one who didn't chip in and that was the exact amount we needed to advance to the next round. Because that's what you're thinking. You run those calculations when you're playing. Like, if the play is a, a, a fast receiver running way on the other side of the field from me as a defensive end, I got to manage that. I got to make some decisions. Like, uh, how much fuel to use on that? Because chances are they're going to get him first. And even if I get over there, he going to be gone. Like, I ain't going to catch that dude. So you manage every moment in the regular season. You don't do that in the playoffs. You go all in, all out. But is it just solely because of the consequences or is there something else at play? I think that it's, I think there's a lot of things at play. Most importantly, athletes who are great, genuinely great, rise to the top. And athletes who are great, yes, the consequences become the fuel. But I think the, the expression of champions hate losing more than they like winning mm. comes to fruition there. Because if you're in the playoffs, the last thing you want to do is lose. And that fuel in, in, in that fire really comes to the surface when the, when the lights are the brightest because you know, listen, there's one thing that is not acceptable in this equation, and it's losing. Because I can't mm. stand it. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm going to win, but I'm not going to lose. Not on my dime, not on my time. That's what goes through a champion's head. And in the playoffs, it brings it out. Man, where were you 20 plus years ago when I was in the playoffs? <laughs> I needed to hear that. That hit me right here because no lie. Everyone tells me I'm competitive. And I will agree like I want to win. But I don't care fully if I lose. And it's not because I'm not trying hard. It's because I have such a sense of self-security that I know I'm going to be fine even if I lose. I'm coming back again. And that doesn't play well in sports because the maniacal teammate I had, the maniacal guys I used to watch, the singular focused dudes who were like, yo, my life's on the line. And I'm like, nah, it's just fourth and three. And he's like, nah, I'm about to die out here. I'm like, nah, it's just uh, second quarter. We good. Like when I saw that guy, I realized he's a different animal. And there's something at play with the guys who are like, my living will and trust is in that football right now on Sunday versus a guy like me who's like being real. I'm going to go back home to the family, to the kids, and it's going to be life as usual, even though I may have a tear or two. Just give me one more motivational, inspirational statement to that because you made me feel a little better, but a lot worse. <laughs> a little <laughs> better because, hey, man, it's, it takes all of us. But I felt worse because I ain't going to lie. Even when we lost, I knew I was going to be okay, and I don't think that was the right mindset. Well, listen. Uh, no offense to, to uh, anyone who is not cut from the Michael Jordan cloth or the Kobe Bryant cloth or the whatever. Like, there are very few humans in any field who are cut from that cloth. So, you know, the Marcellus Wiley cloth of like the, well, the reality is, here, here's the problem. You're, you're too intellectual about it. You're like, let me extrapolate out. It's fourth and three. We make it. Uh, what happens? I go home to my, to my yeah. wife and kids. Okay, it's four to three. We don't make it. What happens? Uh, I go home to my wife and kids. <laughs> like, what's the difference? Uh, the, and that's the truth, right? But Michael Jordan oh, yeah. doesn't think that way. Michael Jordan's the guy that walks around and, and you're like, hey, MJ, I bet you can't make the shot from 200 feet away. And he's like, what did he just say? You don't <laughs> think I can do that? So that's you and I are, are uh, 
Listen, very few are cut from that cloth. I, and look, no shame. No shame in saying, all right, I'm not MJ. I'm not Kobe. I'm not, I'm not that, that assassin out there. Okay, you're good. You played in the league for, you know, decade plus. Boo hoo. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's not just how long I was there, but, but how much I could have got out of it. Like, if I had a Tom Brady mindset, like, what, like, would I be having a, a real ring instead of just I'm married? Like, you know, would I be having something on this? Like, come on, John. Like, the, the problem is, let me just tell you, I needed to understand, I needed to know that this is real. And, and I looked at life as a game. And football is serious. But I was like, nah, football is a game. Life is serious. <laughs> and <laughs> whoever made this got it wrong to me. But I don't have my saying in somebody's studio. So obviously they were right. This is hilarious to see and to really just get smacked in the face in the playoffs because I was 0 for 3 in NFL playoff games. Um, I play defensive end. So let's not act like I had the greatest impact on the game. But oh, for three, same record as you, John. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Same exact record as me. And Marcellus, you can feel good about yourself. Go wear your Chargers jersey. It fits you well right now. Oh! <laughs> Did I contribute oh, to no. that culture? I got to go hide somewhere. I got to go hide. Oh, <laughs> well, are oh no. No, He's no, get no, me. no, 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 hey, no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you better watch out talking that trash to me. Woo, you better oh, stop no. playing with me. Oh, man. There you go. Okay, now, hey, don't, don't let the smooth takes fool you, homie. Where the muscles at? What are you? Oh, I'm getting old. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. This is so good, man. Oh, man. Oh, oh my right. God! I just, I just ran around the room avoiding Marcellus Wiley. <laughs> it's so good, man. It's, yeah, yeah. That's why <laughs> I can hear you huffing and puffing right now. Oh, I'm with you too. Oh man. Well, you know I'm that so was amazing to 3, talk. Three thousand miles apart. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's the only saving grace you have right now, our distance. That's but I will <laughs> close that gap real soon, man. <gasps> well, let's get to our Wileyism, man, and um. This Wileyism uh, obviously is pertinent to what our conversation was today in tribute to Martin Luther King and the holiday. Um, this Wileyism, uh, it hits you different. Uh, racism is the child of race, not the father. Now, if you digest that, you start to realize, as we talked about before, racism is the child of race, not the father. So it doesn't start with racism. The greatest hate is evil, not the other person with a different color. And I think sometimes we get lost up in that tribalism. Oh, the issue is that other person. No, there's a greater force at play that can exist in all people. We don't like to talk about the taboo things, but let's talk about it on Never Shut Up. It's taboo to talk about black on black crime. It's not even taboo to talk about white on white crime, which is greater than black on black crime. But if you notice the commonality in those two phrases, it's intra hate. It's them hating on themselves, killing those that are most comfortable, familiar and in proximity to you. That's what this conversation was about. It's starting to realize and parse between who's really of love and who's not. And that's not going to be color based. I grew up in a home in Compton where we took care of two war veterans who were both white. Uncle John and Aunt Gloria, both white. I grew up with a racial security. Thanks to Martin Luther King Jr. Thanks to my family that it seems like a lot of people didn't have. I had white people in position of need needing me while I was still a black man in Compton. So I never grew up with that viewpoint that I was inferior to white people or anyone. Matter of fact, I knew I had to help people of all races because I grew up helping people of all races. I just want us to take this conversation to a greater place in action. I want us to realize that, okay, 
as much as we have this national conversation and many times it feels lateral about race and we're pointing the finger at you and three pointing back at me, but I'm going to point more back at you that we realize, okay, the way that this thing is designed is to find those of like minds, of like spirits, of love so that we can enhance that experience. That's what I really pray for. John, your closing words when you hear racism is the child of race, not the father. I really have a unique perspective like you do. We all have a unique perspective. And where I grew up, um, you know, when I say my street was the least racist street because we had one of everything on the block. And when I hear you talking about your Wileyism um, today, I want to leave everyone with being very real. And this is just from my point of view. And maybe I'm wrong, but I'm going to tell you what goes through my mind when people say, you don't like me, whether or not it's me specifically or society, you don't like me because of X, fill it in, race, religion, gender, whatever. You don't like me because of that. I honestly feel like communicating to people, don't flatter yourself that anyone <laughs> is thinking that hard. No one's paying attention to you specifically. Life is just running you over. And as you sit there complaining about the reason why life is running you over, it's going to run you over again and again and again. Get out of your own way. Define the problem that is real. And maybe racism is real in your life. Maybe sexism is real in your life. If it is, one solution is move. One solution is communicate and try to help solve the problem. No matter what you think your problem is, standing and complaining is not going to do anything about it. And don't flatter yourself that people are paying that much attention to you. Because in reality, everyone's just trying to get along like they always have. That, to me, is more of the conversation that we need to have is that perhaps you didn't win because you actually lost. Maybe you lost because the deck was stacked against you heavier than somebody else, but also maybe you were part of the problem too. Mm, that's the toughest place to get to, being self-deprecating um, and making your own assessments in self-scouting. That's a very difficult place to get to, very mature place because these are complex issues, multifaceted. The way I give it to my kids as I coach, I always tell them that like in life, they're Legos, like little simple Legos, like these kids love Legos. And then why I break it down to that level? Because no matter what your issue is, it may stack on to something else and seem like it's a big, gigantic issue, a big and gigantic empire as these kids build. But if you break it down to every individual layer, you realize it's just another Lego that you can stack a different way. So as you said it right now, you basically said be greater than your greatest excuse. And that's what helped me not only deal with no racism, I would say, but also more so, no matter what I had to deal with, no matter what you want to term it, I had to overcome it. I had to come out and prevail against it. And it's come in so many ways. You get resistance in the classroom. It's not because of your race, it's because are you putting in the work? Can you? actually understand the work can you put all these things together it could come on the football field he's just faster than you just bigger than you it could come in the workforce the guy has more experience like i just want the confrontation not to always be with someone else but with your inner self john i appreciate you brother thanks for taking the journey with me today on never shut up and for all you guys out there on brinks tv Continue to follow, continue to support. Never shut up on Brinks TV and Reach TV. Talk to y'all soon, like hella soon, like real soon. Let's do it.